So welcome to the going deeply local to build for the long-term conversation. I'm really excited to, to moderate this. We're gonna, I'm just gonna make some introductory comments and then um, I'm gonna pass it up. We, we sort of have this investment thesis between Abby and myself um, that we've come together um, to respect and appreciate in, in each other, which is sort of the genesis of the, the conversation that we're gonna have. And then we'll um, have two really representative uh, sort of case study examples, um, maybe 10 minutes apiece, with Aloysius Atta from Farmerline and David Leventhal from Playa Viva to help us really go local and get grounded into something real instead of keeping it at very high level and conceptual. So, um, if any of you were at the little preview that we did um, yesterday, forgive me for repeating myself, but I, th I think it's an important way to introduce what we're going to talk about. And I want to start by just talking about a man that I came to know um, uh, about named Buckminster Fuller. And I've, I really view Buckminster Fuller as sort of the, the, the prophet of this movement that we're a part of here, the sustainability movement, uh, everything that, 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 that I think we're, we're seeing come together in creating higher levels of well-being, using business practices, using social innovation, using design, came in the mind of, of this man. And I think, in particular, his perspective, and, and he was an inventor, he, he look, looked very much at the big picture, but was also able to really <coughs> build things. He's the inventor of the geodesic dome, so the, the big Olympic domes, the, the one that you see in Montreal uh, from the World Fair, those, that was his design, and you see him everywhere. So he, not only did he have the big picture, but he had a really grounded reality. And he believed that nature had its own coordinate system that he called synergetics, that the whole was much different than, the, than just the sum of its parts, and that you couldn't necessarily predict the outcome by looking at the parts of what a whole is. And in his experiment, which he called, uh, he called himself guinea pig B, B for Bucky, that was his nickname. And he set his mission, his objective for life was to f discover his own, nature's own natural coordinate system because he became to believe that if he acted in accordance with this natural coordinate system, that he would find all the resources that he needed to flourish and survive just like a tree or a plant or a flower or an animal would. And so, as he began this experiment, he, he questioned, well, what, what is humanity's role in this coordinate system? And what he, what he came to believe was that human beings are natural information gatherers and information, or, or, and information gatherers and problem solvers. And he viewed that essentially from the beginning of human history that we, as a planet, as humans, were having these isolated experiments all around, all around the globe in survival, of course, but also how to develop increasing levels of well-being. And it was only through the development of more sophisticated transportation systems, communication systems, were we able to start to compare and contrast this, these diverse experiments, these solution sets, you might say, of what humans did to try to survive. And I think it's interesting that at this moment where perhaps humanity is facing its, some of its greatest challenges, that we have these social networks and these incredible communication systems to compare and contrast because I think diversity is the key to survival, it always has been. So, um, 
we at Halloran, I'm on, um, Philanthropies, we have gravitated toward looking at whole systems, at ecosystems, as a fundamental way to guide the way we think about investment. Where we're looking for the catalytic solutions, not just by individual organizations, but how they fit in the, in the larger system. So if you imagine these solution sets, and an ecosystem can be Oaxaca, Mexico, where I live, or it can be Mexico, or it can be much smaller, it could be a village. And um, I think that this now, as I mentioned, is now amplified by these incredible social networks. So these combinations of local ecosystems and global platforms like, say, uh, the Hub platform or the Fab Labs or, or those, those kinds of global platforms that are based very locally are, the, are, are, are together creating an, a very, very powerful way to, to problem solve. And for us, we think that not only has it allowed us to become smarter faster, it's allowed us to create more trusted networks of relationships that allow, allows us to act more quickly, even where there's a lot of risk for our capital. And I think it has allowed us to create, um, to, to think about and act in a much more um, holistic, systemic way, of course. So that's part of the, the, the first part of the thesis. But the second is, okay, well, within an ecosystem, within a local ecosystem, how, how do you take advantage of the local wisdom of the local knowledge, of the local um, attempt at solving problems. And it, it should come as no surprise that human-centered design might be part of that, and that's part of what, what Abby is going to delve into for a few minutes now. Um, thank you, Mark. So, um, I'm not sure if you all actually know the Lemelson Foundation, the organization I represent, so I'll just start with a few words about the Lemelson Foundation and, and as a background to launching into um, building local ecosystems. So, um, the Lemelson Foundation was started by Dorothy and Jerome Lemelson, um, the uh, family behind the philanthropy that I work for. Um, and Jerry Lemelson was, like Buckminster Fuller, an inventor, an extremely prolific inventor. He had over 600 patents to his name. He was, the stories I hear from the family is that he would wake up every night with an idea, and he would have his wife, his wonderful, wonderful wife, Dorothy, um, wake her up and say, sign my book, sign my book of ideas to witness that he had come up with this idea, an incredibly inventive mind. The thing is, he struggled his whole life to be recognized for that inventiveness. And um, when he was finally, late in his life, recognized for his ingenuity and his constant problem solving, um, the ecosystem for most of his life did not work for him. Um, but it finally came through, and um, when he finally had a fortune, um, he started the Lemelson Foundation in order to help others like him, uh, ingenious, inventive minds who have great ideas that could lead to products that improve lives. So the Lemelson Foundation, uh, following uh, Jerome Lemelson and the family's belief, uh, in the power of um, invention, science, engineering, and technology to solve the world's problems, um, continues with that mission to support invention to improve lives. Um, I'll focus the rest of uh, um, what we're talking about on our developing country work. We actually have uh, significant programs for us, at least half of our giving is actually in the United States, but. Um, I'm particularly interested in exploring um, today our developing country uh, engagements. So, how does this relate to what we're talking about today? Um, the Lemelson Foundation works in the very, very early stages of invention. So, um, our programs, if you think of a pathway of a, of a product, 
Um, you've got a person who's inspired to actually create something, he has an idea. Um, he then actually has the, uh, has the skills, goes through you know, um, great training, uh, strong engineering school, strong design schools to actually build something with value. And finally, has the wherewithal to develop an enterprise, because we do have a very um, strong bias on entrepreneurial de endeavors, um, to develop a business that will actually disseminate and bring that potential solution um, uh, through market-driven mechanisms. Now, we are, we are basically, for this whole vision of a pathway, we support in inspiring people, in educating people, providing them the training and skills to actually invent and develop enterprises, and finally, the very, very early stage launch and support to companies. So we inspire, we help educate, and we help incubate. Now, in the eight years that we've spent in working in developing countries, we found that the most successful companies follow a very specific blueprint, what we call the invention enterprise blueprint. Um, and my apologies if you've seen this before, I just do this if you've heard it before, because I feel like I've talked about this the whole week, but, um, <coughs> excuse me. Every successful business that we've invested in has four key elements. They have a very strong, robust technology. They are based on a very, very well-defined human need. They are driven by a, an innovative, strong, robust business model. And finally, and this is a critical piece, there is constant iteration across all three of those elements, typically through some human-centered design uh, process. And it's constant. You never, these companies never um, stop innovating and iterating across all three of those pieces. So that comes to uh, today's conversation. The, the problem that we've seen, we have networks of inventors all over the world. Um, many of them are based in, you know, Bay Area uh, universities, Stanford labs. Um, they're based in scientific institutes, in capital cities, in developing countries. Um, and the critical barrier we see there is, in a way, the, the, the siloization um, of these inventors. They hardly ever talk to their customers. Um, and the intent is there, but the ability to actually get feedback that will enable them to really define well a problem, to develop a solution, is just not there. And so I'm interested today in exploring with, um, with Alloy and David how they, within their own ecosystems, are actually engaging and talking to the communities in which they work. How can that model actually inform all of the others out there who we know to succeed need to talk to the people they're actually trying to help. Um, that's Alois. Alo Aloysius. <coughs> yeah. Um, my name is Aloysius, and uh, I co-founded a company called Farmaline. And uh, our goal at Farmaline is to produce, uh, is to help smallholder farmers across Africa to produce and sell more food. Because currently, smallholder farmers across the world are currently feeding one third of, the, of humanity, and our goal is to help them to produce more food to feed the future. And why is this so important to me? Why is this so very personal to me? Is because I grew up on the farm. When I was a little boy, um, my parents broke up when I was just five years old. And I had to leave the city and go back to the village to stay with my aunt, who was a small-scale farmer. And all she does is she to uh, uh, grow uh, cassava and yam and potatoes, and uh, she harvests it, bring it home to feed, to feed my sister and I, and she sends the rest to the market to sell, to generate money, to see us through school. Now, you know, we've seen her struggle. We've seen her struggle to access uh, information on new farming techniques. I've seen her struggle after producing to go and sell to make money to see us through school. So uh, fast forward, when I was able to make it to, to the university, um, I received a call from her one day. And I was really surprised, because you know, when I was staying with her when I was five, 
the only technology available to her is just the radio set. So I said, you know, this is a very great opportunity because currently in Ghana, there are more mobile phones in Ghana than people. And then I started thinking, how can I use this technology that is now available to my aunt to help her to produce and sell more food? And you know, I started thinking about that because in Ghana, when you're, able, when you're lucky enough to make it to the university, it means two things. It means that maybe your parents are rich enough to send you through school, or maybe your community is able to support you. And that's my case. I grew up in a family community, and all my family, my uncles, my aunties, all came together, they farmed, and they put their resources together, see me through school. And you know, what is usually expected of you when you make it to the top is to be able to finish school, get a very good job, and give back. And in, now in Ghana, it's very, very difficult to get jobs. So you know, I was thinking, what can I do to give back before I get a high-paying job? And, and the only thing that came to mind was uh, to develop a, a, a technology that will help her and the farming community to produce and sell more food. So then, you know, the only technology which was available was a mobile phone, so we decided to build on SMS. And you know, we did that by just doing researches online, we didn't speak to any farmer, we didn't speak to any stakeholder in the system, we just built SMS and we're so excited about it that, hey, we are going to change the world. And we made our first trip to meet about 150 extension agents. In Ghana, the extension agents are people who are employed and tasked by the government to go to villages to teach farmers like my aunt, you know, new farming techniques to help them to sell. And we're surprised to find this, this uh, uh, statistics is that as at uh, the year 2011, um, the ratio between extension officers and farmers is one is to 2,000 which means that each extension officer will have to move from village to village to speak to people like my aunt to train them. And, and that put the future of our country at risk because 60% of the workforce is made up of like these poor small farmers. So we are asking ourselves, how can we do this? So we're, we're talking to the extension agents that we have an SMS application that will help you. And, and they were really hostile. They said, hey, you guys, you can't just finish school. We, we've been in this business for 20 years. You can't just finish school and bring an SMS application and think that you're coming to take over the market. And we said, no, we are here to help you. We are here to use this technology to make your life better, to make your work easier, so that you can help people like my aunt living in villages. <coughs> and, and when they were able to understand that we are here to help, you know, they gave us a very crucial feedback. They said that, you know, SMN is not going to work. It's a bad idea. Because, you know, we are limited by 160 characters, and also most of the farmers uh, in the villages cannot read and write. And in Ghana, we can only send SMS through English, and they can't read and write. So it means that if we go ahead to send information through SMS, you know, it will be useless to these farmers. And then, then we came back to the drawing board with this feedback. How can we use what the, the um, what can we use the feedback that we've gotten so far to incorporate into our design to build something that works? They said that you know, if you're able to transfer, we should find a way to tra tra to transport their voice to the farmers. One, because you know, the farmers know their voice, they know them, they build a relationship with them, they trust them. So if you're able to send your voice through the farmers through technology. It will make their work easier, and it will make the farmers trust the information that we are sending out. So then we were trying to see how we can build a voice application that we can give to the government and other agriculture NGOs to use to send information to farmers. We tried, we, got, we went to India, we asked people, and you know, the, the money to do that was very, very expensive. So then we decided to build ourselves. We got funding from Indigo Trust, uh, um, and a donor agency based in the UK. Um, they believed in our idea, so they gave us just 5,000 pounds, and, and we're tasked to build a voice application. And we're also tasked to be able to reach 500 fish farmers in Ghana, in rural Ghana. And you know, we're so excited that oh, finally you know, we are going to do something to give back to our community. So after building the application in March and launching, we went to uh, a Catholic Relief Service uh, conference in Accra, where all, all the uh, ICT for Development partners across Africa and some in uh, 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 South America came. And, and I did a presentation on how that you can use our application, our voice application, to send information to anybody at all who cannot read and write in their own local language, and how you can use that same application to, do, to conduct voice surveys to collect data. And, and we're so surprised to, to realize that um, uh, across the development sector, they spend so much money trying to communicate and to collect data. So we had USAID coming into the system to say, hey, we, you know, we've been facing the same challenge. We spend thousands of dollars trying to communicate with farmers living in rural villages. We spend a lot of money trying to collect data. So let's try our software and see. So they, they signed an agreement with us to use our software for, for three years and one for, for six months. 
And you know, we're so like, very happy about the adoption rate, how that we were taxed with reaching only 500 farmers, and we got 2,000, and how we got two big uh, donor agencies to use our software. And, and we understand that it's because of how we approach the whole design process. We, 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 we realized that because we had a buy-in from the beginning, we built with the local folks, we built with the extension agents who are, who are trusted, who are respected, who had authority when it comes to agricultural extension. And we also built with uh, uh, NGOs who, who gave us feedback. And the one crucial feedback that we got from uh, USAID is that, you know, currently the application works online. You have to log into our dashboard and send information. And they said, what's even on the field? And I want to send information. Do I have to go back to my office to log into the dashboard and send information? I, I have to be able to use a simple mobile phone, a simple mobile phone like Nokia 310, to be able to record myself and send it to thousands of farmers. And that's one great feedback that they gave us, and we're very responsive and we're able to build it immediately for them. And so many other NGOs are so excited about the idea. And uh, also, um, in Zimbabwe last year, uh, in July, they did their uh, uh, presidential election by uh, July 31st. And we wanted to see how the software will work in other African countries, because you know, we, we only used it and tested it in Ghana. And we're so surprised that for the first time, um, the youth of Zimbabwe are empowered by this tool, to conduct a national survey to, to tell the stories of what the citizens expect from their government. They, they, they were able to know uh, how much are being paid of workers that are involved in the uh, informal sector and, and whether if uh, um, uh, graduates from the university are able to get jobs or not. So our, our plans for the future is to be able to make it easy for NGOs operating in Africa and other developing countries to use our software to communicate with, uh, with people who cannot read and write. That, that will help them to save money, it will give them direct access to their beneficiaries, and we also want to be able to make the, uh, the system more user-friendly and make it more simple. And, and we, we also want to continue building it with the local folks to get to a point whereby it will be very easy for even the simple farmer to just use the mobile phone to send out calls to thousands and thousands of farmers. Thank you. Uh, Just a, a quick question before we move to David. Uh, tell me a little bit more about how you discovered that that voice was the was, was one of the keys, and how how do you like? Is that something that you just sort of intuitively would have thought of, or did, how did you discover that? And how do you? make sure that you keep discovering those kinds of things. Yeah, so when we got the harsh feedback from the, uh, from, from the extension agents from our first prototype, just using SMS, we came across a, a document called the IDO, Human Centered Design Toolkit, and that, that document actually helped us to build uh, specifically for the farmers and all the other uh, stakeholders involved and how to take feedback from them. So we use the tool, uh, first of all, they, they, they advise us that before you, you build something, you should be able to listen, first of all, to the people, the people that you are building with, and you should be able to design for them, with them too. So we, we asked them, like, what to work, and they obviously told us that voice is the way. But we didn't write any, any line of code until we recorded, like, voice messages in, on our laptop, and we met about 300 of them, and we played it to them, that like, if you get this kind of information, like how to apply fertilizer, how to harvest your fish, where to sell your fish. When you get it on the mobile phone, just on a laptop, would you appreciate it? Would you like it? And, and, and they gave us the go ahead before we actually went into building. So, so we are really committed to this. And, and we, 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 we think that you know, we had all this success because of the way we approached the design. And we, we still want to continue building it in that way. That as we move forward, we want to keep listening to the farmers. We want to keep listening to the other stakeholders involved in the sector. Great. Thank you. Thank you. David, can you tell us about Playa Viva and, and uh, what, what kind of, uh, or the keys to, I, I mean, I definitely want you to give you a, an outline of, okay. of what you did and how you did it, but, but I also want to really think about the same question I, I asked Aloysius, is how, do you, how did you connect the stakeholders, the diverse stakeholders that were involved in the project? Yeah, I was just taking some notes. Um, as Aloysius was talking, to remind me of a couple of things. Um, the first slide talks about one of the things that Playa Viva has done is we move beyond green, beyond what we call sustainable or net neutral, to what's called regenerative and the regenerative development. And the whole idea behind the regenerative development platform is that it's a whole systems thinking program. And a story that came to mind was as part of that regenerative development process, we interviewed 
the town elders and ask them, you know, what they've seen as kind of the change in the community that they're in and how it's evolved and what their hopes, dreams, and aspirations are. And what came back from that was that they saw kind of a lost generation and that the town, like the migration has been to Ziwanehu Ixtap or to Mexico City or even to El Norte. And they really want to see the vitality come back to the town. And what's interesting, and I mentioned this at the last point of the slide there, is Julia Garcia, who's now our general manager, literally walked in the door of our hotel the day we opened. She had just been let go at Club Med because of swine flu. They had to get rid of their whole middle management. She was in charge of restaurants there. She had worked for 20 years with Club Med, and she's from the town of Huluchuca, this town of 500 people, and had come home. And now she's managing the largest enterprise in the town and you know, helping her community to regenerate itself. So you know, that was just one quick story that came to mind as you were okay. talking about how doing this regenerative process and uh, kind of how it's gone deeper into the community just by asking them that question. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was uh, our investors include uh, Verde Ventures with Conservation International, one of the great names in conservation, and then Root Capital, they actually made us go through the gears process. And as part of being evaluated for gears, you know, we're looked at and we're asked, how green is our supply chain? And we had hired a, an intern to work with us to the first pass of the GEARS certification didn't get us as good a certification as we wanted, so we got an intern in to kind of go through it again. And in that process, we developed our own mini GEARS, where we began to work with our supply chain and our community to ask them the same questions the GEARS was asking of us. How green are we? How are we including the community and following certain rules? So that's another way in which Kind of this outside community affects us, and then we begin to bring those same processes in. Uh, related to the regenerative process, one of the first things you do is you develop a set of guiding principles. So we sit down as an entire group in the charrette process, and these is what came up as our guiding principles, promoting biodiversity, generating cleaner water and energy, promoting a transformative experience, which I think is what happens in communities like that, um, creating a le living legacy. And the important one is this question of meaningful community and what is meaningful community and how do we affect the different communities that we serve. So what was the charrette process? The charrette process is, um, uh, the, the word charrette comes from a French word meaning the cart in which the, at the final exam of the architect, they would bring in their cart with the models and the plans and everything else and have everything in one place. And the charrette process brings in members of a very broad community. So you're looking at not just the architect and let's say the owners, but you're looking at potential guests. You're looking at members of the community and the elders. You're looking at biologists, archeologists, anthropologists, uh, as many different points of view as can be brought into the process to begin to look at how you're developing and make it the whole system's thinking into the design process and really open yourself up to it. So from that came, came those, those um, guiding principles. Uh, related to meaningful community, and I've done an entire presentation just about what we do on the meaningful community standpoint, but we've really, over the years, seen that we focus in on three things, education, healthcare, and economic development. These are the areas where we think we can bring to bear the resources that are part of this larger community. That includes our guests that come in from the outside and maybe a doctor who comes in for vacation but says, what's happening in the local health community? How can I help out? So a story that just came to mind there, there were pediatricians that came in, wanted to go to the local health center. We went down there and they thought, oh, we're gonna help them do added value services um, maybe teach some clinics. Um, and we waited for the doctor to finish and we went into the clinic and the clinic was, it looked like it had been destroyed. I mean, the, 
ceiling was falling down. It had no hot water heat. Just basic elements were missing there. And so the doctors, these guests, put together an entire program to go raise funds to start with a hot water heater, and it involved the community, where the community was responsible for providing the labor, and they would provide the, the supplies for it. So that's how we really become this conduit between the varying communities that are part. We don't direct, we just provide access to opportunity. I think that's a key example of how we work. Did, did, did that seem um, forced at all did it, to, to the locals? Did it seem natural? Did they, did they, was that an easy sort of transition from um, a Western doctor walking in and seeing the, the state of the clinic and, and the, 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 the ability for him to, to jump in? Or what was that like? I mean, there's many different ways to answer that question because, um, you know, when you work in developing countries like that, so many times, A, they're working with so few resources. They are used to people coming in and kind of dumping resources. Um, you know, part of what I was gonna get at is, in this next slide, this Korean parable, if you'll uh, let me digress for a bit, it's this parable about um, this prince that was gonna be king who went to see a, um, a sensei and was, wanted to learn a lesson, and the, the sensei said, well, you know, I'm, go out and gather all the firewood you can and build the biggest fire uh, and come sit with me by the river. And so the prince goes out and gets all this wood and comes in and builds this huge, huge bonfire to prove what, how good he is. And the sensei sits there quietly and the bonfire just burns all night while they're sitting by the river. And this, the, he's like, what's the big lesson? Please teach me. And at the end when the fire was, was gone, he said, well, did you learn your lesson? And the prince like, what lesson? And he said, you know, when you got here, the river was running. And then you went and you built this huge bonfire. And now it's all burnt out and there's nothing but embers. But the river's still running. And so we really look at our, our development from the standpoint of, are we being fire or are we being water? And so, you know, we need to make sure that whenever we come into a situation like that, we're not just dumping equipment and it's fire, but it's, okay, how do we work with you to make sure that it's, it's water, it's river, and it's community, yeah. so. Great answer. Um, this was another example related to, to water that I had mentioned um, in our, when we were on the plenary, which is, I don't know if you can see from the slide, but Playa Viva is located at the base of the watershed. So everything that happens up the watershed ends up in this estuary. So we are literally what I call a toilet bowl of whatever happens up, up the watershed. So what responsibility do we have to work with the community to make sure that the watershed is clean? So we really started to look at what ways we could work with them to clean up. One of the obvious one was to work with the agriculture waste that comes down the watershed. So we set up this organic agriculture class and brought in hundreds of farmers, as you can see from the photo, to work with us on that. But the, the feedback loop that came from it was, this is all wonderful and we'd love to farm this way, but who's gonna buy these goods? Who's gonna buy what we make? And so the challenge has been moving from not just us being the consumer of that, but setting up a marketplace so that there's a broader market for them to to, to work with. So these are some of the challenges we deal with in these cascading cycles, as you like to say. So I think the uh, kind of last challenge is th that, you know, how do we replicate what we've done at Playa Viva and begin to do it in other locations? And that's where we've set up this concept of regenerative resorts to begin to look at our business model and do it in other locations as well. Great. Thank you, David. Um, I want to spend a little bit more time before we open up to questions, delving in more to the, the ecosystem that's surrounding where you work. And yeah, it's one thing to have an idea, to, to start engaging some people, to, to, to you know, identifying a challenge, engaging people into the, the process of find, finding out how to, to solve that challenge. Tell me uh, I'll, I'll, a little bit more about the, the ecosystem of players that evolved, that began to support your work. 
but at the same time allowed you to, to stay true to, to what you were doing. The ecosystem of players? The, the ecosystem of players, whether it was USAID or, or some of the outside influences within the ecosystem, the local ecosystem that you were working with. Yeah. What was it like to, to start to begin to work with, with these different organizations or, or groups that maybe didn't have the same view that you did? Yeah, and when we started first, uh, by then we just had the idea. And uh, I spoke to uh, uh, an organization that has been in the space for the past eight years. They've been using SMS. You know, and I was pitching to him and he said, look at you, you know, you're just, a, you're just a, a school boy, you know, you don't really understand the, the market, you don't know how it works, you know, what shows that you have adequately the, the mental fortitude, you know, to carry this and carry it forward. If, from there, we, we realized that we have to be able to work hard, you know, you know, to earn a seat at the table because it's not very common to have a startup in a development space in, in Ghana. Like, we have so many other startups there, but they are focused on other things. So we realized that we have to be able to work harder. We, we can't afford to do uh, uh, a mediocre work. We have to work hard, as, just as hard as uh, any other business in the space to, to, to be able to succeed. And we also realized that we can't fight against them because you know, the guy in the space has been working for eight years. They are valued at like um, um, 20 million dollars. So if you really want to go and fight with them, we would you know, we just die early. So, so we decided to work with them, even though in, initially we, we, you know, they, they really underestimated us. Uh, along the way, we went to work with them and it made everything easier for us. For instance, uh, the guy who said, uh, you know, the biggest player who said, you know, we can't do anything. When we finished building our voice application, uh, you know, I, I made it a point to go back to his office and, and do a demonstration for him. And now he used the application to, to be sending information to farmers and now we are working together. And now we also got the extension agent who initially thought that SMS was not going to work and we are school children, we can't go on. We, we went to them, we, we, we explained to them that we cannot do this without you. We don't even have the expertise you know, to provide the content. We still want you to use application to make your work easier and better. So they bought into it. David, do you, can you answer the same question? I mean, as the different, as the, as the project evolved and you, you began working with the community, but also you were trying to raise money to, to, to invest in the community. I know that you had a, um, a very people-centered centered funder and a very, uh, eventually attracted a, a more environmental f funder. What was that like? Was there, was it, did that happen naturally? Did, or tell me about that. As far as fundraising and... Fundraising and how, how they came together to, to create what we're talking about in these these cascading cycles of impact? Um, you know, the, the funding side, believe it or not, happened here at, at SOCAP. I mean, the, the initial meetings that we had with um, Root Capital happened right here. And it, it took about a year or two for that to all evolve. Um, and, you know, Neil Indemdar, who's with or was with Verde Ventures is doing a session somewhere else, but if he were here, I, I, I remember when we finally finished the funding with him, he, he looked at his database and said that the first time our name popped up in his database was almost four years before the deal had actually closed. Um, but, you know, those guys do similar but different things because they are all, you know, uh, Verde Ventures is funding from... Uh, uh, Starbucks and does some coffee work and the same thing with, with Root Capital. So they, they do similar deals in, in many ways. It's, it, they're more overlaps than are apparent from it um, because I think whenever you are involved with uh, social investment, you, you're involved, you know, people are involved with place and they're, inter, they're interlaced inextricably. So um, I think I think the interesting part for us with the investment side was really more on the due diligence part, on how deep that they went into our business and the, and the work that was done. Um, and then, as I mentioned in, in the earlier slide, related to the gear certification process that really became a benefit to us and our ability to, to push it back out to the community. Um, but I think from the, the cascading cycles, it's much more organic. Um, and it, it happens in the most unexpected ways sometimes. Um, you know, two quick stories. One is Earth Day. We, we have people that, that kind of work 
doing community development work with us on site, and so she, uh, Morgan had organized an Earth Day celebration uh, with, uh, with the community and went, reached out to the school kids to help clean up the rivers and do trash pickup on the rivers. And this, in exchange, they cooked pizzas, because we have a pizza oven for the schools, and we had um, non-soda drinks for the kids as well, which was important. And the teachers gave Morgan, who had done all the community organizing, a list of supplies that they needed. And right about the same time, I had read about this nonprofit called Pack for a Purpose. So we kind of put those two together and put the list out to all of our guests if they wanted to bring school supplies in. And now it's gotten to a point where we've provided enough school supplies for that one school where it's really moved up the watershed. A similar thing happened where uh, Julia, who's the manager, was at the school handing out supplies and it was raining that day, and she noticed the kids were waiting in line to use the bathroom and were getting soaking wet. And so she developed an entire program to fix up the bathrooms and get them to a point where the kids had a covered area, and then we looked at the bathrooms, they needed new toilets, and they needed new sinks, and water, and everything else. So that was a project that she initiated that was done with a guest. So these cascading cycles happen very organically. It, you know, those, are the, those are the wonderful surprises about what you do. You know. Abby, if you want to join in, uh, please do. I, I only have one more yeah. question, but go ahead. I did have one question, actually, to maybe we could end on, but in the Lemelson Foundation's experience in um, working through partners to build ecosystems, there are two specific players that it struck me actually are not very present at SOCAP. So I was kind of curious in terms of your own experiences at Playa Viva and in Farmerline, what role, if any, the specific stakeholder of government and universities and academic institutions actually have played in either hindering or helping your work? Yeah, so um, our first client actually came through my professor in a university, <laughs> you know, because they were doing workshops for fish farmers every year. And um, what they were doing is that they, they, they fly all the fish farmers from across the country into one location, they, they house them, and, and they're trying to teach them all, all the research that they've done uh, for, for the last year through PowerPoint presentations and through like brochures. So um, I pitched to him that, oh, you know, uh, to support what you're already doing, how can we make sure that, okay, these farmers are not just attracted, are not just coming here for socialization and for the free food. How, how can we make sure that they, they keep receiving the information that they came to learn here? So then the, the idea from my also came to place. And, and he pushed uh, for me to get the deal with uh, USAID, which was our first customer. Hmm. And also, uh, coming to government, um, even though I did fisheries in school and we had some, some people in the team to provide the content, even though we can provide content that works, we still need people who has the on the ground knowledge, who, who know the farmers, whom the farmers know and trust. Even though the information that we also have is valid, even when we send it to them without the local force in government, the farmers are not, the farmers are not going to take it. So when we realized that we worked with the government, even though they were not buying, even though they were not pay us money for the system, uh, they just coming to volunteer to record the message and sending out, sending it out to the farmers, help us to increase adoption and help the farmers to trust that farmer is really legitimate and we are here to help them. So those are the roles that we got, even though it was not in terms of money, but you know it was it was really helpful. Yeah. So I would say government would be involved on a couple areas. From the construction side, it was really the whole permitting and being involved. We're on the beach and we have the waterways and that's all considered federal land. So we really had to go through a whole environmental impact process. We also have an archeological site there as well, which involved the government and the ENA who came in and had to do a whole study of our site and say, yes, you have an archeological site. No, we're not gonna take the land from you, but you can't you know, go in these areas and do these things, and th this is what the meaning is. Um, we also have a turtle sanctuary on site, and we have mangrove, and I think we've wanted to engage the government more so as Playa Viva, Playa Viva being a model for sustainable development, and I think we're still under the radar, but have begun to make 
relationships that are getting us higher up in the visibility with the government. Uh, with universities, I would say there's a couple of areas in which we've interacted with universities. There's a local technical school, and we have got, we're 100% off-grid solar where we are, so we've really wanted to work with them on, and we're also off the phone grid there, and are, so we've really tried to work with the technical school to help do some capacity building so that they are training people how to be solar engineers and be able to come and service us so we're not having to wait for people to come from Mexico City to, to service us. Uh, so that's on the local level. The other one is we've been lucky to be engaged with Stanford and they have a, a center for responsible tourism development um, who've really used us as a model for sustainable, sustainable development. And that's been a wonderful community to have out there. So, Great, thank you. We're going to open it up to questions. If anybody has a, a question for any of us here, please um, raise your hand. We can have the microphone come right up to you. Hi, Gauri Mirpuri. I run something called the Learning Farm in Indonesia. We take um, vulnerable youth, street kids, and they learn organic farming. Um, and then find a way to go home back to their villages. Really interested in the SMS program that you have, especially the voice program, because we work very much with the farmers and the whole community. Um, what are the kinds of messages you put onto the, um, what kind of uh, you know, tools, what kind of training do you give the farmers? Because there's only this much you can put in a voice SMS. And do you need a special phone for it or would any, Cheap Nokia do, you know, the, the, the sort of rip-off phones that you get from China for $20 now. Can those do that as well? And just a quick comment about community engagement for us. We um, have something like 12 corporates who said they'd like our program, but we make sure that they don't just give money, but they come in and they teach units to the, to the kids as well. And each of them has got a specific, so it's not organic like with your program, but it's very specifically aimed at what we are trying to fulfill in our curriculum. We do the agriculture, but everything else that they need to know to get back out there um, and face the world again, we get our corporates to come in and, and teach to them, and it works quite well. So the question is about the SMSing, please. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that question. So um, aquaculture in Ghana is very lucrative. In fact, the margin is very high. When, when you sell your fish for like $2.5, when it ends up in the restaurant, they sell it for $10. So, so many people are, are like uh, encouraged to enter that sector. And, and the bigger your fish, the more money you make. And uh, uh, over our pilot, one thing that we try to teach is that so many people thought for you to get a big fish, you, you need to pour a lot of fish into the water. So we spent a lot of time trying to educate people that you, you don't actually have to pour a lot of fish into the pond, because if you do that, you lose your fish. If you do that, you actually have to, if you want to grow more fish and make it bigger, you need to feed it 5% of the body weight. And, and it's surprise you that this is something very simple that people should be able to get, but we spent about six months trying to like communicate this technology to them. And also, we didn't record long messages to the farmers. We organized workshops. And after the workshop, we used the voice calls as reminders of what they've learned through the workshop. So, so the average length, mostly, of the message that we sent is, is within two minutes. And it works in all phones. So we record the message, um, we log into our platform, we upload it, and we send it out to the farmers that we work with. They, they all get phone calls. And they pick the call, then they hear the information in the local language that they best understand. If they want to replay the message, they can press a key on the phone and replay the message. So assuming they're on the, the farm and they are busy working and they miss the call, the system will call them back until they pick the call. And if the network is also bad, the system is intelligent enough to detect if the network is bad for, to, to call them, the farmers back again until they receive the message. Yeah, any phone. It works on any phone. Yeah. Another question. Hi, um, this is a question for David um, on, on the, basically, you know, we heard this morning about uh, the difference between what comes first, impact or return. And, you know, it's, it's um, very good to hear you, David, speak about Playa Viva in a way that you don't mention really a difference 
So I was wondering if you've done any analysis on the profitability of Playa Viva versus, say, just a standard, um, you know, hospitality or, you know, just a normal hotel, and whether really everything you've done in terms of helping the community and, and, and you know, regenerate the place is something that actually has affected your costs or whether these costs are, are you know, important versus the benefits that you're getting. <laughs> Wow. Um, a couple ways to answer that question. First of all, I think the market that we go after, the reason they come to us is because of the values that we stand for. So we have to invest in that first. Um, but I, I want to give an example. Um, we, we have 200 acres, and around us, a cattle farmer has bought basically all the land around us. And he has slashed and burned everything. And so, at the same time, since we purchased the land, we've been regenerating it. We saw what was there and have planted 10,000 trees and re brought back the mangrove, which then brings back the fish, and um, have this park, this forest, in the middle of just devastation around us. And it's, it's, I can't wait for the new Google Earth map to come out, because then you'll really see the difference that's there. And you know, I was just in New York, and, and you see Central Park in the middle of New York, and, and what's the value of property next to Central Park? You know, what's the value of what the Playa Vivas of the world are going to be like when there's all that devastation around us? So, you know, the, we have a, a, a permaculturist on, on staff, on budget, and there's a budget, there's a line item for regenerating the land. And that's an investment that I make all the time. Um, I have to believe that it's in our long-term best interest when people come and they're surrounded by so much nature and so much abundance and so much biodiversity. Um, that changes the equation. It's something you just have to believe in. Uh, but there's another model that we've taken as well. We used to ask for donations for the turtle sanctuary that we have on site. And that was part of the, at the end of the bill, it would be, here's your room, here's the bar, here's the massage, yeah, yeah. and then would you like to make a donation to the turtle sanctuary? Um, we've now added a regenerative trust fee of 2% which is optional, you can opt out if you want, but we've now added that to it, and that fee then goes towards the community fund, which helps for the Turtle Sanctuary and other community projects like that. So we ask our guests to participate in that part. That's good. Did that answer your question? Anyone else have a question? I have one. Um, I'm really curious. Um, from the from the eyes of someone that's starting a new project in a in a new local ecosystem, wherever it might be, what advice would you give to someone that started that you wish you would have had when you started your project? Yeah, in my case, if you want to start a, a project, especially ICT for development development project, don't you know you have to try and speak to those who are already doing it in the space, you know. And the mistake that I made from the beginning was that when, when I met that big guy who was in the space for eight years, you know, when he said those uh, mean things to me, you know, you know my, uh, my ego came up and I really wanted to, you know, prove a point. So I did not actually approach him to ask him, you know, what are some of his failures to learn from it so that I could also omit that. So I, I, I also committed some of the mistakes that he has made, which I could have avoided should I have spoken to him. So, you know, my advice is that if you want to start something in the ICC for the development uh, in the space in Africa, you have to try and identify the various players who are already in the space. And you can get a lot, you know, you can get what you've learned for the past eight years or 10 years in just one minute, uh, one hour, two hours of meeting them. And you can avoid the same, you can avoid those mistakes and do the work better. Because after all, you know, what is more important it's not about you, but it's about the impact that you want to create. And I think that's what you, the newcomer into the space, and all the other guys in the space share in common. And I think you need to take advantage of that. I, I think in relationship to this panel, 
I'm glad you asked that question because I think it's, it really is going deep into the community that we're serving. And I wish we would have understood them a little bit better. Um, just what the different constituencies were and who were the leaders um, within the community. I think we did a lot of fire early on and it took us a while until we really understood the community and understood that we were there to stay and that they were understood that we were there to stay and that we were gonna be part of that community. So I, I think that's a perfect question to kind of ask uh, to close it out, at least for me, because it is really go deep, go as deep as you can into that community. We, I met a guy uh, on the way back from a SOCAP conference to an SVN conference, uh, a guy from the Krupps family who basically does that. He does mapping of communities um, and really goes deep into almost household by household of who's there and what are the political groups and the religious affiliations, et cetera. And I think had we done more of that in our charrette process, it would have helped us realize what we needed to do to, to be a tributary into that river. I, I think what, uh, from my perspective, from my experience, another issue that, that we face in Oaxaca and, and I've seen it many places is there's a lot of well-intentioned people that, that, that really want to do the right thing at a local level, but they don't know how. And um, I, I think that has burned a lot of people in villages and communities. So there is sometimes a, an inherent distrust that why, this, why would, would this be, wouldn't be the same situation where, for example, the government decides that a particular um, area needs, uh, should be all about ecotourism, builds uh, cabanas for them to use to rent out, but without even asking the village, or a, a solar technology that, that's dropped in like, like an alien and, and then becomes yeah. furniture, you know? Um, <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I really appreciate the, the perspective. And just to bring it back to where I started, um, do, do you have one more question? To not get off the learning part real quick, but um, I'm interested in knowing, I saw that you have 2,000 farmers out. It's, you've been out for six months um, since you've launched, and um, you said it took six months for your farmers to get to understand the product. So how much of your time, and, and this is a little bit, just understanding the learning around integrating customer feedback or user feedback in everything that you do, how much sort of time and resources do you devote to um, getting that feedback, and then how do you digest that feedback once you have it? Because um, that also takes time to, to gain insights. So. Great question. Great question. Yeah, so we, we actually started uh, last year in February, but, uh, but we launched this year March. So we spent like a year and one month studying these farmers. And we have to go and live in, in villages. You have to go and see what do they do in a normal day? You know, who do they interact with? What do they spend money on before we actually finish building this product? So, so we spent a month, and, and uh, by then we didn't get funding, so we were using what we were learning and the idea to apply for competitions in, in Africa. So we, we were winning some of the competitions and we are getting grants from them, and we are using it. And we also position ourselves in a way that uh, students like in America and Canada who are doing, uh, like, who are doing their thesis on our, on, our, on our topic, we send them emails and they fly down to Ghana to volunteer for like months, and, and we get free human resource in return to help us to develop our product. So those are some of the ways that we use to come to, come to this point. Great. So, um, thank you very much. I just want to sort of tie the conversation back to sort of the way I introduced it and why going deeply local is so, so important and something that, that we really want to see more of because we're, we are able to share, you know, information about these solution sets, these ideas around the globe that allow us to do things better. There's a great author, Stephen Johnson, who's wrote, written a number of books, Emergence. His most le recent one is a book called Future Perfect. One of the things he says is that diversity not only uh, expands the common ground of, the, of consensus, but it increases the larger group's ability to solve problems. And I think that that's what we're 
we're doing in forums like this. And what we hope to do in a, in a, a forum on social innovation that we are planning for Oaxaca, Mexico in April called Catapulta, where we specifically are aiming to try to let people compare ecosystems and how, how our networks support them. So I invite you to that as well. And if you want to know more about that, come and see me. But thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.